Despite mixed reviews from critics, The Witcher, Netflix's surprise hit series, has become one of its 10 most popular shows. It's a fantasy story full of corrupt kings, scheming sorcerers, shady politics, and honorable underdogs, with plenty of heartfelt characters to root for. The show stars Henry Cavill, who plays Geralt, one of the last Witchers, a mutated race of humans that were created to protect all of humanity from monsters. And while the Netflix series remains closer to the storyline of the books than the popular gaming series does, it still takes some considerable digressions, which I believe strengthen this story's translation onto television. The Witcher turned out to be a catchy, bingeable series because the material was restructured to create rich, dimensional character arcs that are reflective of four archetypal attachment styles that everyone can relate to in relationships. Full disclosure, this review does not compare the storylines to the storyline in the book or to the video games or to anything else that it is not. Rather, this review examines how well The Witcher on Netflix accomplishes what it set out to do in its own iteration. Now this subject matter is a bit of a digression from the content I usually share on my channel. So why am I sharing it today? Well, it's because of the kind regard of a YouTube subscriber like you. One of my subscribers sent me an anonymous message. It says, in case you need a cosmetic distraction for a moment, I have no idea why this second YouTube showed up on my alerts under yours, but seeing them together just made me laugh so hard. Now, if you can't tell, this is a picture of Henry Cavill in The Witcher. Right beneath it, there's a notification of a video I premiered called Four Strengths of the Rolling Stone. Altogether, it reads, Four Strengths of the Rolling Stone, Small Details You Missed, and then a half-naked picture of Henry Cavill. And I laughed so hard Number one, because I thought, my audience, they really get me. Because I got this text literally after I had finished binge watching season one. And so I consider signs like this winks from the universe. So I decided to apply four attachment styles to the show and fill in those small details that the universe apparently thinks that I missed. I also intend to explain why I think this series is actually so well done, despite some of the critics' feedback. Now, before we dive into that, if you don't know me, my name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board-certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator, and I have been in the field for about 13 years now. And I help individuals struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want, without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using three practical tools and principles, and that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experiential. And here today, as we start to talk about the character styles of The Witcher, I hope to help educate you on attachment styles and afford some cognitive reframing for you. So make sure you subscribe, like this video, and ring the bell for notifications if you want more content like this. So let's examine four important characters from The Witcher and their attachment styles and talk about how these attachment styles can be demonstrated archetypally, but also how they can and do evolve over time and in relationship to others. And fair warning, there are spoilers in this video, so make sure you watch season one first. So of course, the first character we are going to discuss is the main character, Geralt, played by Henry Cavill. <laughs> Geralt is one of the last witchers, which is a race of mutated humans that were created to protect humanity from monsters. I am going to categorize Geralt as dismissive avoidant, what I like to call a rolling stone. Like most individuals that struggle with dismissive avoidance, he suffered emotional trauma and neglect as a child. Without explanation or even a goodbye, Geralt was abandoned by his mother to those that made him into a mutant and endure severe training for what he was to become. As a result, he is now a social outcast for having been indoctrinated into that service and been robbed of a normal life. Despite his intimidating appearance, there is something charismatic about his broody countenance and even temper, which tends to draw you in. Geralt carries many of the strengths of a rolling stone, such as an air of authority, skillfulness and follow through when it comes to his job, and he abides by a high moral code of behavior, even if it is at an emotional cost to himself. Witchers are said to have no emotions, and in the series, Geralt seems to use this prejudice to his advantage, as he maintains a stoic face and put off disposition when needing to interact with other human beings. Overall, you get a strong but silent type vibe from him. 
Like many Rolling Stones, however, he shows a soft spot for animals and for the downtrodden. We see this when he sympathizes with disenfranchised elves, refuses to kill monsters that are intelligent and don't hurt people, and in the first episode when he prefers to chat and confide in his horse. Also notably in the first episode, Geralt shows sympathy towards a troubled princess. In fact, he is apparently seduced by this wronged princess whom a sleazy sorcerer wanted him to kill. But even though we are later led to believe that this seduction must have been in part due to her magical powers of persuasion, you get the sense that Geralt feels for the princess's plight. When he offers her the sage advice to get the hell out of Dodge and start a new life for herself instead of getting mired in the consequences of the revenge, she wishes to extract upon the sorcerer who tried to kill her. Of course, she does not heed his advice, and when backed into a corner, Geralt's sympathies do not stand in the way of killing her and her men when she leaves him no choice but to defend a young girl. This leads us to believe he is a man of his word, and a man that cannot be swayed by emotion even if that eats him up inside. Now this is clever storytelling because it makes us respect him, sympathize with him, and hate him all at the same time. Which incidentally is how most people who love dismissively avoidant individuals feel. The cracks in Geralt's facade become apparent, however, when he meets his match in Yennefer. Then we start to see more of the dimensionality of attachment, which can sway us all when we are confronted with the mirrored aspects of ourselves in a lover, at the right place and the right time. When Geralt meets Yennefer, he is coming off a job in which he was tasked with helping a young girl survive a terrible curse that turned her into a horrible monster through no fault of her own, but rather the fault of her parents. His sympathy for the girl rather obviously stems from a younger part of himself who was also poorly treated and abandoned, and he nearly dies trying to save her. But, of course, he manages to accomplish his task. And so we are led to believe that perhaps parts of his emotional self, his inner child, if you will, are drawing ever closer to the surface. This is further nudged along by a dichotomous relationship with his eager companion and bard, Jaskier. We will discuss the insightful but troublemaking Jaskier in greater detail later on, but for now, after saving the girl who would have died a monster, we see Geralt once again putting himself in harm's way to rescue Jaskier from the deadly consequences of Geralt's own bad idea. Geralt wishes to unleash a djinn, which is basically a horrific genie that would grant three wishes. Geralt cannot sleep, and the djinn appears to be a quick fix option. In this series, Jaskier represents several things, but in this episode, he suggests Geralt's sleeplessness might be because he's ignoring deeper-seated emotional issues and is resisting his destiny. Geralt rejects this notion and wishes Jaskier to give him some peace. In doing so, he inadvertently instructs the djinn to silence Jaskier with a deadly affliction. This scene illustrates the horrible fate that can befall you when ignoring a deeper calling or conflict in favor of quick fixes. And that theme carries throughout the rest of this episode, if not the rest of this season. In this episode, Geralt's quest to save Jaskier leads him to meet Yennefer. When he meets Yennefer, she has abandoned the order of sorcerers that trained her and seduced an entire town with her magic. She's relatively bored, directionless, and even a little reckless after realizing she had sought validation in all the wrong places and given up too much of herself for it, i.e. the ability to have a child. And so when Geralt presents his conundrum to her, Yennefer now sees the djinn as a quick fix to her plight. She also realizes that her powers have no effect on Geralt, and this makes him very appealing. Now you might say, well, anyone could be a good match for her so long as she doesn't try to control them. But this would go against her nature as a, what I call a spice of lifer. Now, in my own vernacular, spice of lifers are associated with disorganized attachment or what is sometimes called fearful avoidance. And individuals who have this attachment style also typically come from traumatic backgrounds. Yennefer's childhood would certainly fit this bill. Much of the first few episodes are spent introducing us to Yennefer as someone who is deformed and crippled, and thus bullied and rejected by her community and her own family. She is even sold to an order of sorcerers by her own parents, knowing that she could potentially meet a terrible fate. Yennefer earns our deepest sympathies as she is repeatedly challenged by a seemingly unsympathetic headmistress. 
We also grow to love her through the charming and secretive love affair that evolves between her and the drop-dead gorgeous Istred. As an aside, this plot point appears to be a refreshingly inverted play on gender stereotypes and Beauty and the Beast themes, so big thumbs up for that. I also couldn't help but fist pump the air when at the end of her training, Yennefer snubs the Order's disregard for her desire for placement and undergoes a radical and painful physical transformation so that she can take what she wants anyway. Yennefer emerges from her training as a powerful sorceress and a woman who owns her own sexuality. She has the willpower, drive, and tenacity to get exactly what she wants. She will never again be beaten down as a victim of circumstance or deceived by and subject to male affection. At that time, she believes the status of being a mage to a king is what will grant her this freedom. But by the time Geralt meets her, she has already discovered that that dream was a false perception. Just before meeting Geralt, Yennefer comes to empathize with the king's queen, who described herself as a fleshy contraption for squeezing out heirs who soon after is murdered for not producing a male heir. Yennefer tries to save the queen and her female child, but fails, and in the end, both the queen and the baby die. This is a rather glaring illustration of the death of Yennefer's previously held grandiosity and ambitions, while at the same time an opportunity for her to confront her own inner child. In doing so, she realizes how precious was the part of her that she gave up and even scorned for her own ambition. With this realization, the seeds of a new direction are planted, a direction towards self-recovery. She wants to regain the ability to have children, presumably because she wants to have and give the love that she never got. As a viewer, you do feel like this is a sympathetic motivation, but Yennefer is so defensive and prickly by this point, it is really hard to root for her. And this is often how individuals feel around Spice of Lifers. They pull you in while pushing you away. You want to love them, but they make it so damn hard. And so what is so poetic about the timing of when Geralt and Yennefer come together is that circumstances have been emotionally priming both of them for this encounter. In other words, they are particularly open and ready to fall in love with someone that reflects back to them all the parts of themselves that they may now need to entertain, embrace, and accept in order to live a more fulfilling life. In The Witcher, as in life. These lovers are both given opportunities to embrace what they need, even if it does not arrive in the form that they wanted. These challenges appear especially during an episode in which they must protect and serve a wise old golden dragon and his eggs. Now this might be a little bit on the nose, but it is a delight to watch nonetheless. Inevitably, unfortunately, both fall back on their fears and false beliefs about reality and themselves, and they ruin their chances with each other, sabotaging what they have found. Yet, more hopefully, both Geralt and Yennefer continue to evolve beyond their relationship on their own and find bits of what they were seeking in other unexpected ways. So, for example, in the last moment of the season, Geralt finally connects with his charge, Ciri, and ousted child princess whom destiny has determined to be his to protect through the law of surprise. In finally accepting responsibility for the care for another human being and embracing a child specifically, which was the very thing that Yennefer wanted, which Geralt thought was impossible, Geralt assumes a deeper sense of purpose, which is ultimately what he truly has been lacking. Yennefer returns to the order that trained her to ultimately reconcile with her prickly and seemingly unfair teacher, realizing the regard and admiration her teacher had for her all along. And in doing so, she's made privy to an aspect of the order that intends to meddle where it is not supposed to, in order to protect the good guys in a war that is going on all around them. She also experiences some pleasure in mentoring other young women. In essence, Yennefer realizes those she had once villainized were not necessarily all bad and also decides to align herself with a purposeful cause, thus accepting that perhaps things are not so black and white. At one point in the series, she says, my world is cruel. You enter, you survive, you die. But in assuming this cause, it means she is learning to integrate life's frustrating shades of gray, thus accepting the bad with the good, and this is the essential task of every spice of lifer. 
Now I did mention that we are going to discuss four attachment styles, and so now I want to show how both Geralt and Yennefer's story arcs are supported by characters that reflect these remaining two attachment styles, and those are anxious and secure. So let's tackle anxious attachment, which I refer to as an open-hearted attachment style. And in The Witcher, I believe Jaskier, Geralt's sidekick, is the best fit for this attachment style. I see Jaskier as a foil of the parts of Geralt that actually do wish to belong to society, that can charm the ladies, and wants to feel all the feels. Geralt's constant annoyance with Jaskier also suggests that these are the very traits he wishes to suppress, much like a Rolling Stone would. Now, on a positive note, Jaskier is funny, friendly, approachable, insightful, and creative. Despite his charming manipulation, you do get a sense that he means well overall and has a big heart. Like a quintessential open heart is primarily Jaskier's concern for the approval of others and validation-seeking behaviors, however, that get him into trouble. And so in this series, we see this most prominently illustrated with his fetish for sleeping with married women, idealizing and romanticizing the brutal things Geralt does, and deflecting Geralt's often mean-spirited rebuffs in order to remain attached to him. Jaskier also has an opportunistic quality to him, and you might think of this as taking advantage of your opportunities, but you could also view this as a tendency to wait around for when circumstances dictate your chances for you, instead of creating your own. In other words, it's a form of settling, which open hearts are notorious for talking themselves into. In some ways, this is how Geralt helps Jaskier evolve. Perhaps Jaskier sees Geralt as his meal ticket initially, but in truth, he could have chosen a much more amiable and or socially acceptable knight to follow around. Jaskier is not perturbed by the way others shun Geralt. In fact, he sees it as an opportunity and a challenge to change people's perceptions of him. And through Jaskier's creative talents, he manages to accomplish this goal quite well. Geralt becomes a legend who is respected and welcomed by the towns they visit. In this way, Jaskier does begin to see the power his talents have to create opportunities and mold the reality around him. And Geralt starts to acknowledge Jaskier's usefulness. Jaskier also helps Geralt to know what it's like to feel accepted and wanted and to appreciate the rewards of that. And so deep down, it's likely that Jaskier is admiring and attracted to Geralt's stoic nobility, self-discipline, and self-confidence, which Jaskier tends to lack. Geralt needs no external validation for what he knows are his capabilities and appears rather unaffected by the disdain he encounters from the people around him. Comparatively, this would really depress Jaskier and likely do a number on his self-esteem. For Jaskier's character to evolve, he will have to assume some of Geralt's traits for himself and show some self-respect, self-restraint, and self-advocacy. Of the more prominent characters in The Witcher's Season 1, I would say Istred is the most secure. He has his own passions and pursuits and remains consistently focused on that throughout his studies at the Sorcerer's Order. He is kind and generous with Yennefer from the beginning and his love for her is sincere, even if he spied on her at his teacher's behest. When this fact is revealed, he informs Yennefer that he knew she was spying on him too, and accepts that that's just what they both had to do to make it through a tough situation. But it doesn't mean that he didn't love her, and now that they had a chance to be happy and leave it all behind, they should take this opportunity. This forgiving attitude is one that comes from an understanding that people are generally good, multidimensional, and this is a secure perspective to take. Istred was also the only person during Yennefer's training who was privy to the full capacity of her power and was not afraid, competitive, or dismissive of it, but rather loved her all the more because of it. He was also playful with her and could find the humor in her rather unique sexual fantasies. Additionally, her physical deformities did not deter his attraction. Istred loved Yennefer most completely for who she was. Istred's only flaw was perhaps his emotional availability. Yennefer scorned him for his betrayal of her to his teacher without acknowledging her own betrayal of him to hers, and basically accuses him of being boring and unambitious. Indeed, perhaps it was Istred's privileged upbringing that prevented him from understanding Yennefer's conflicts and what her ambitions meant to her. It also means that the stakes of betrayal were not actually the same for both of them, and he could not seem to understand that. 
This is where sometimes secure people can get themselves into trouble because they can have a somewhat rosy view of the world and the intentions of those in it and accept what is handed to them without questioning it too much. Later in the season, we see Istred falling trapped to this when he buys into the army of Nilfgaard's promises to fund his research with nothing but the best of intentions, while in reality, Nilfgaard is truly the bad guys that are tearing down the world around him. But altogether, if Istred's character had a message for Yennefer, and by extension for us the viewers, it would be that sometimes you have to do hard shit. And sometimes people are flawed, but it doesn't make them all bad and it doesn't negate the feelings you had for them or that they had for you or all the good stuff that you shared with them. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And as the season progresses, we see Yennefer eventually come to this conclusion herself and seek out Istred to see if he would have her back. Istred confesses he missed her tremendously and desired her for a long time after she left, as any secure but her heartbroken person would. But when given the chance, he realizes that they have irreconcilable values and their incompatibilities were insurmountable. This is exemplary of a secure approach to resolution and closure for something that just isn't working anymore. Granted, it would be more believable if he also weren't a little brainwashed by Nilfgaard, <laughs> but in comparison to all the other characters, Istred appears to be the most emotionally grounded. If you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments below. And also tell me of other movies and film series you might like to see analyzed through the framework of character conflict and attachment. And remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on our monthly live stream Q&As.